Okay, this is Synoptic 3. And it was supposed to start with more about Luke's introduction and how he wraps around Matthew, but because of the ignorance in Christianity about Jewish culture, and frankly, you know, a lot of the Jews are ignorant of it too because it's suppressed or not taught, I have to first go back to the source of the meaning of Messiah. Okay? So that's what you see on screen here. Um, we're in the Old Testament. The left hand side of the screen is 2 Samuel 7, which is the promise to David of Messiah. And the right hand side of the screen is Daniel 7 13 and 14 which gives rise to the Son of Man title that Christ himself uses. And hopefully by now uh, you've seen the John 8 videos on the Great I Am, and you've seen the Son of Man <coughs> video series, both of them. The Son of Man video series is five videos showing the use of the term in Greek throughout the New Testament. Um, so you've seen both of those video series, so you understand something of the importance of Daniel 9.13. And this, fortunately, on the right-hand side of the screen, uh, is pretty well admitted by all of Christendom, no matter what the denomination. Of course, those who want to try to claim that Christ is not God will try to argue against this. And when they do that arguing, they prove that they are completely ignorant of Jewish uh, culture. They're completely ignorant of Hebrew and the use of words in the Bible and the Old Testament. That is the major reason why there's so much dispute about the Gospels. That's the major reason why uh, people are preterist. They do not understand what the Old Testament had to say in Jewish terms. Okay? There's been so much anti-Semitism in Christendom that we actually have lost understanding about what the Old Testament means. Fortunately, the Jews amongst themselves have never been monolithic. There's always been a great deal of debate over whether Christ is Messiah in Judaism itself. So we have a 2,000-year-old paper trail also in Judaism of this debate so that we can find what Jews have believed since Christ and have argued since Christ, both pro and con him. Now understand that the Jewish argument about Christ is phrased in Jewish terms. And in all of the arguments amongst the various sects in Judaism, you're going to find that they, they all try to get along with each other on being Jewish, on observing the law. That's their flaw. Just as in Christianity, we all try to get along with our differing sects by saying, well, we all believe in Christ. That's our flaw. It's a, it's a trying to get along with people flaw. We're trying to get along with people at the expense of getting along with the Bible. It's criminal. We're all guilty, Jew and Gentile alike. And what I'm trying to do is like navigate through all these different debates to the scripture itself and then try to explain to you where you can find proof of what I'm talking about on the internet because you can find it but you have to look hard and I'm not going to give you my sources because what I do is I concatenate and sort of uh, synthesize from a wide variety of sources that agree and disagree to get what I'm telling you and I'm expecting God to witness to the truth of it or to where it's wrong and I'm expecting him to lead you in your own search to find out this information because you have to learn it yourself whether you were hearing it from a teacher or from a researcher like me that's what I'm technically am I'm a librarian researcher and it's an okay job for a woman I don't you know I argue with God about that daily but it is I have to accept that now so this is where it's coming from. And then I'm expecting you to talk to God about this and do your own research, okay? Whether you want to do that or not is up to you, between you and him. Left-hand side of the screen, 2 Samuel 7 promise, highlighted in blue, the promise of what? 
verse 13. He shall build a house in my name. I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. Now, think about that. It's his kingdom. His not the kingdom of him and his descendants. There's no promise of descendants. In 2 Samuel 7, 13, his kingdom. That means the person sitting on the throne will be king forever, will never die. You got that? That is not, it is a promise to David and his descendants. See, verse 12. I will raise up your descendant after you. But there's no mention of descendants in, Dan, in 2 Samuel 7, 13. It's his kingdom. Who's? Messiah's. And how do we know that? From Daniel. I mean, we, we, knew, we knew it before. You know, Daniel's after Isaiah. Isaiah talks about it all the time. That's what day of the Lord is coming from in Matthew 1. Okay? The coming day of the Lord. That's where it's coming from. Or not Matthew 1, but I think it's Matthew 3. Alright? That was in the first Synoptics video. Right hand side of the screen is the fulfillment of the promise in the left hand side of the screen. Daniel 9, 7, 7, 13. I kept looking in the night visions, and behold, with the clouds of heaven, one like the Son of Man was coming. I'm not going to go through the mistranslations in here. Son of Man is the title you want to focus on. That is a unique title in the Old Testament. It is recognized as a unique title in the Old Testament by almost all the denominations in Christendom and by Judaism. It's one of the rare instances where all these groups that hate each other agree. The alternate name for this person is Messiah. It means anointed one. HaMashiach in Hebrew. Ho Christos, which is where we get the word Christ in Greek. And it's translated that way in the LXX in Daniel. You can search on it. So all these battling denominations, you know, battling over their turf, their pride, their whatever, you know, God is second place. They all agree on this one thing, that there is such a thing as a Messiah. He is uniquely named here in Daniel 7.13. He is the fulfillment of 2 Samuel 7.13. He's one person, he lives forever. Even the Muslims agree with this. They just disagree about who it is. Okay? And they disagree about what his office is once he gets here, the Muslims in particular. The Muslims say Christ is the Messiah also. In fact, there's one guy who's, you know, really controversial in Islam called Harun Yahya. Yahya means John in Arabic. And he's, he's, he's making all kinds of books and stuff like that about it. You can look him up on the internet. They also call it Maitreya in Buddhism. Maitreya to come. They also call him the Mahdi. Alright? Mahdi is another word for Messiah. In, in uh, Islam, he's a general who ushers in the, you know, the, the coming back. And some versions of Islam think that, you know, Muhammad will be resurrected. You know, in other words, a Christ figure. And they get that, um, well, they get that from a lot of different um, surahs, but I'm, I'm not going to talk about Islam that much. I'm getting too far off topic. What I'm trying to get at here is there is a certain, there are certain few points where all these battling religious groups agree and then they disagree on the fringes of what these points mean. But where the agreement is, is that Son of Man is coming back to reunite the world, to take over at the end of time. Okay? And that this person is also known as Messiah. And that this person is also a son of David. And will live forever. 
Okay? Now, in Judaism, and again, Judaism, like Christianity, is not united. It's, it's arguing too. In Judaism, there has always been a strain of Judaism, which used to be the majority view, that this Son of Man is God. And they get that from here. Okay? Ancient of Days is Father. But Ancient of Days is also Son. And it comes in here. And that's why Daniel is essentially invoking Psalm 110.1, which is the Lord said to my Lord, come sit down by, by me until my en your enemies are a footstool for your feet. That's talking about his father talking to son. Same thing in Isaiah 53.10. The contract between father and son. Both are God. And the reason why you know this is true in Judaism is that the only one who can pay for sins and, and rule, and the only one who can give forgiveness of sins and rule, and the only one who can be Savior and rule is God. And that's why Psalm, um, Isaiah 63 reads as it is, especially in the middle where it's talking about Father's role. You are God our Father even if our Father human fathers reject us you are our father God and that's making a play on the name of Abraham which Christ is also doing in John 8 toward the end especially after uh, John 8 37 you know because he's answering the Pharisees about fatherhood because they're, they're invoking uh, Isaiah 63 when they talk all right so Judaism well knows, and it was always intended, that God take on humanity, and in that humanity pay for sins, come back a second time as God-man, and rule. The world ends when he comes back the second time. That's what Psalm 90 is all about. The promise of that happening. Israel being the queen of the nations for the thousand years when he comes back the second time. Then history ends, eternity begins, and Israel was supposed to be, supposed to be, the bride of Christ. But she forfeited that role when he came the first time. That was why the Mosaic Law was there. Because when he came the first time, she was supposed to be ready, trained, believing in him, voting for him, at which point he would still have been destroyed by the Romans. He still would have gone to the cross. That was all Isaiah 53. One way or another, Isaiah didn't name in Isaiah 53 8 exactly who were the authorities who would oppress him and bring him to trial. Because it could have been only the Romans. And obviously there would be, you know, Jews who would, you know, be in, in cahoots with the, with the Romans. But if the Jews, Jewish nation had voted for him, the Romans still would have gotten him to trial. He still would have died for sins. Then there would have been a civil war in Israel, as it was anyway. Then he would have come back seven years, 57 years later. That was the schedule per Psalm 90. And then the millennium would have begun. That was the deal. And this is what Daniel is talking about, and it fulfills the left-hand side of the screen about the, the, the king, his kingdom forever in 2 Samuel 7, 13. So it was always known, even though Judaism today is arguing differently, it's not a monolith. It was always known by at least some Jews, and it used to be a majority. That's why the Pharisees are talking the way they are. They used to know this. The Pharisees in John 8 were expecting God-man, and they were saying Christ wasn't that God-man. It was always known that the Savior of Israel was going to be God-man. That's the very meaning of the Tetragrammaton, Y-H-W-H, -H, as I covered in 3Q of my LXX, um, my, my great I Am videos. Okay? So that's something you've got to understand as the meaning of the word Messiah. The Jews of Jesus' day did not believe he was Messiah because they did not believe he was God-man, no matter how many miracles he did. To be Messiah, you had to be God-man. And they kept arguing that he was only man, that yes, there was a Messiah, but it wasn't him. And that's what Isaiah 53 predicted. 
Oh, lo, to, ar lo. He's not the incarnation. Okay? His form, it's tra mistranslated form in English. His incarnation, it's mistranslated the word form. His form isn't isn't the, the the predicted one. There's no glory there. All right, that's Isaiah 53 too. They rejected him being God man, which is exactly how John's gospel starts. He was God and he became human. Y H W H, Y H for Haya, W H for Hawa, in Hebrew, to be and to become, respectively. So. When you see the word Messiah, or the Anointed One, or the Christ in the Gospels, what you're looking at on the screen is what it's talking about. The one who's God, who's going to take on humanity as a son of David, and come pay for sins, and the second time come back and rule the world, with Israel being the Queen of Nations, inaugurating the Millennium, just as Moses promised in Psalm 90. And Isaiah continued the promise by emulating the meter that Moses used. And then Daniel, not in this chapter, but in Daniel 9, follows up that meter in Isaiah 53 using the same meter. And then Paul continues the meter in, in Ephesians 1, 3-14. I've done many videos on that if you want to look them up. All showing the text and the meter live so you can examine it yourself. So that's what I had to say, make on this video, is to read you into the picture as to what Messiah means when Matthew's introducing it legally and when Luke is going to start introducing Jews, even though he's writing to a Gentile, Luke is going to start introducing Jews to show the fulfillment of the Jewish prophecy and the political issues it creates. That is the central theme of all the Gospels, and you can see why, looking at what you've been looking at on screen now for 20 minutes. Think about the impact of this. Hi, here's this promise of this guy who's going to be a son of David, coming from this little nothing dusty nation that happens to join three continents. And he's going to take over the world? And just beat up everybody else? That's the blood in Basra verse in Isaiah 63, 1 at his second coming. And this is the guy who's both God and man? Ha, ha, ha. God becomes human. Well, that's an old Greek myth. So what, are you copying from the Greeks? That was the taunt by the Greeks to the Jews. Actually, the Greeks got it from the Jews, but that's a long story on another topic. So deus ex machina, God comes down to save the Jews and trample everybody else. Isaiah 63, 1. That's a political issue. Israel's claiming that their God is the God, beating everybody else. And by the way, at the end of history, this God's going to come back and beat all your gods and beat you up too. And you better believe in him now because you're going to live in hell forever if you don't. That's a pretty powerful and not particularly nice political message. Believe or burn. And we Christians inherited that. End introduction, and then in the next increment we'll come back to Luke. Well, I'm not quite done yet. <laughs> Figures. Okay. We gotta go, we gotta circle a little more on the Daniel 713 passage so that you can understand the God-man connection that it provokes. And when I just finished that last segment, I realized the mistake that I had made by not covering it, so I'm going to do it now. We're now back at Daniel 7-9, which I've just highlighted in blue, whereas before I was just focusing you on this to show Son of Man. See here, he came up to the Ancient of Days, but you see here, and the Ancient of Days took his seat. He's got clothing, and the hair of his head is wool. This is all going to be tapped by John in Revelation. So you see, look, the Ancient of Days takes a seat. Only humanity sits. My pastor made he must be laughing from heaven right now. So many things he said to me, not to me, but to our class that I didn't get, I'm suddenly getting now when I make these videos. Okay, so the Ancient of Days 
comes up to the ancient of days. You get that? See the word play? That's where you know that Daniel is invoking Psalm 110, 1. If they're both God, they're ancient of days. It's a title meaning, you know, old. Really, it's, I think it's, does it have Olam in there? Olam is a famous play on Hebrew. Okay. All right, Atik. Um, where is it? Oh, I just saw it. Atik. There it is. Okay. So he, he comes up to the Ancient of Days. See, that's Yom. I mean... Yeah, I mean, is the key word in Isaiah 53, 10. All right. So the Ancient of Days comes to the Ancient of Days. All right. And then in the LXX, you have it transliterated, which means it was an official title. In other words, it's a title, not, um, not literal. Okay. Titles have literal ideas behind them but they don't necessarily are, aren't supposed to be taken literally in the sense of oh well there was a day when the ancient of days began all right it just means old okay and then the idea is that God is older than everybody else okay so the ancient of days takes his seat the son of man comes to the ancient of days this is God coming to God all right, and since only humanity sits, but he's called the Ancient of Days, he's God, man. Now, what I'm telling you right now is kind of common theology. I mean, you know, the only people, because they're so incompetent, who would dispute this interpretation are going to be those who try to say that Christ is not God. And they've been proven wrong so many times for centuries that you just throw them out. Anybody who says Christ isn't God is not filled with the Holy Spirit, cannot be filled with the Holy Spirit, and until he starts using 1 John 1 9 regularly, nothing of what he says is really very worth listening to. Okay, I mean, even a drunk speaking the gospel in Calcutta will get it right, because God can enable you to stay right information even when you're, you know, carnal. But frankly, people who don't know that Christ is God are so incompetent, you'd really be better spending your time listening to somebody else. Okay, and here's one example of that. See, you have to know Jewish culture and Jewish terminology. All the Jews know that this is a title of God. That's why Christ is invoking it here, because all of this is in context. The Ancient of Days takes his seat while only humanity sits. So he's God and man, right there. He came up to the Ancient of Days. Who would be superior? It's one Ancient of Days sitting before another Ancient of Days. Now, the parallel passages you want to look at in Scripture to see this God-Man connection are going to be places like, um, you know, the, the visit to, to Gideon, for example, where there's an angel, and at first he just thinks it's an angel, and then he realizes it's an angel of the Lord, and then later in the passage you find out that the angel of the Lord is the Lord. So Okay, in order to better cover what I meant um, in the last increment, instead of going straight to Matthew's themes, I'm going to have to circle on this meaning of uh, God-man. And in order to do that, we got to go back to verse 9 in Daniel 7, where you see this term, Ancient of Days, took his seat. You've got Ancient of Days. That's a Jewish title for God, meaning God's older than everybody else. And the same Ancient of Days is coming before the Ancient of Days. That's how you know that Daniel is talking back to Psalm 110.1.1. Ancient of Days taking a seat means that it's not God, too. See, Ancient of Days means God. But taking a seat, sitting down, 
means human or angel or something, but not deity. So you have a combination of deity and not deity. All right? And one of the titles for God is Angel of the Lord in the Bible. And that's a very clever thing that, you know, uh, Daniel is doing when he uses this phraseology because he's now invoking all the Angel of the Lord verses. And when you look through all those verses, like with Abraham and Gideon and Hannah and Moses, okay, uh, Joshua at Gilgal, for example, when they first entered the land, you have to look at the context. And the people who claim that Christ isn't God never, ever, ever are good scholars. Just throw them out, okay? They're, they've got a political agenda they're advancing, so they never, the same problem with the Calvinists and the Catholics. They don't, they, they cut out the context, just like Satan cuts out part of Psalm 91 in the second temptation of Matthew 4. Okay, people who want to cheat you, people who want to advance an argument and lie about a thing, they cut out context. And by incorporating the context here, Daniel is invoking all the angel of the Lord verses because in most of them, not all of them, you find from the context that the angel of the Lord is the Lord, making an appearance in some kind of bodily form. Why? Because Ancient of Days was going to take on humanity and pay for sins going to become the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world, just like Abel was sacrificing a lamb from the beginning, just like Genesis three fifteen through 22. Okay, you shall bruise his heel, and he shall bruise your head. That's talking about the coming of a person, a human, from the woman, born of woman. Isaiah 9. A virgin shall conceive. Virgin meaning really a virgin. Parthenos in, in the Alex X of Isaiah 9. Okay? So it was always known that this was going to be God-man. And by taking Ancient of Days here, and Ancient of Days here, linking Ancient of Days to Highest One, see, Highest One, Most High, only is used for God. That's a demon. the demon's favorite term for him okay highest one the most high I like the phrase most high better but highest one is accurate okay his kingdom will be an everlasting kingdom you see all these evocations ancient of days came and judgment was passed in favor of the saints of the highest one the highest one is the Christ the the Messiah the Hamashiach so ancient of days as God also takes on humanity and this whole passage is about that second coming that's fulfilling second samuel 7 as we saw in the previous increment all right that's how you know that the son of man title which is a synonym for all these other titles son of man is equated with ancient of days right here okay the white snow and hair like wool, of course, is in Revelation. To hearken you back to this passage, it's a method of incorporation by reference. Highest one, most high, is exclusively a title for God. Okay? And it's repeated. See, the repeating of keywords tells you the relationships between the keywords and tells you that they're all being equated to reference different aspects of his role, his rulership, his nature, and equating him with God. He came up to the Ancient of Days. He is the Ancient of Days, and he comes up to the Ancient of Days. This is a kind of Hebrew wit that fortunately ports over in translation. You can see it in English. Look, the Ancient of Days takes his seat. Well, then he's more than God, more in the sense of besides in addition to, not more greater than. And so the Ancient of Days takes his seat and he comes up to the Ancient of Days. Angel of the Lord is the Lord in so many passages of the Old Testament. So theophany 
is something that was well understood by the Jews and the theophany was a presaging of the fact that he would take on humanity and become a son of David and save the Jews. Because only God can save you. It's something God has to do to save you from your sins. That is the heart of Judaism. That's why the Jews, even today, no matter what their sect, will say, well, we don't know who's saved. Only God can save. God will tell us at the end. Okay, the more self-righteous of them, you know, use that as their excuse to either do good works or to not say anything about somebody else's status or their own. And you see Christians do the same thing. It's got a very ancient source. Okay, the ancient source is all this wordplay. Only God can save. So God's going to take on humanity and save. It's the oldest story of mankind. That's where the Greeks get their mythology from. Adam taught this story to his kids. This is the promise to Adam. That God will take on humanity and pay for Adam's sins. That's Genesis 3. And it gets more and more refined and more and more localized into a particular you know, a particular progenitor, Abraham, then a particular kids from that progenitor, through which all the nations of the world get saved. It's not a hard story to understand. And as you can probably guess, it's an extremely political story. Because just think, the people who belong to the race that this God will take his humanity from are going to get real pig-headed about themselves and get real fat-headed oh well, we belong to the same race that's like if you wear Nike basketball shoes you're as good a player as Michael Jordan it's that kind of illogic you know if your great 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 grandfather was a signer of the Declaration of Independence somehow you're better than somebody whose father wasn't a signer of the Declaration of Independence never mind that most of the signers of the Declaration of Independence were pretty uh, how do you want to call it pretty snarky people alright they had their skeletons in their closets I'm sure many people now know about the ones in Thomas Jefferson's closet, not to mention, you know, George Washington's vanity and some of his problems. You know, all of our founding fathers in America were um, not exactly sinless. Was it important that we have a signing of a Declaration of Independence? You bet. But they were signed by fallible people. All of our kings and queens have been fallible too. Okay? And because you're related to one of them, doesn't make you better than the next guy who isn't. And guess what? Here we have the Ancient of Days uniting everybody to himself on the cross. So we're all related to him. So we're all equal. At least positionally. What we do with our position is another story. Okay? So here we are, all of us, in this one, who designed the whole thing takes on humanity, yes, of a particular group, yes, of a particular family, but that family isn't better than others because he did that. But I'll tell you what that family is. That family is more persecuted than others. And that will be covered in our next increment. Again, I'm sorry all this background is needed before we can even get to why Luke says what he says to wrap around Matthew. Okay, now we're back again, and again we're back in Matthew. This time we're going to go through it pretty quickly, thematically, because I want to show you um, the main way to track the Gospels so that you know how they interrelate. Okay? We've now in this three synoptic, we've looked at the fact that Messiah means God man. Okay, um, we looked at it's a fulfillment of a promise to David, a promise that's been made since Adam. We've looked at some of the terminology of that promise and how Daniel 7 relates to 2 Samuel 7. And then, of course, that makes it a lot easier to understand subsequent chapters of Daniel, because Daniel 7 is the last chapter that's written um, in Chaldean, or maybe it's Daniel 8 that's the last one. Um, it reverts to Hebrew, I think, from Daniel 8 forward. So understand that this, is a, this requires to know all this, 
requires you to have extensive understanding of the Judaic understanding of their own holy book, and which understanding is just as fragmented and fractious as Christianity, so that you are always faced with the question, whether Jewish or Christian, okay, but some of these, not all these can be right because they're conflicting. So there's always each one of the denominations in Judaism or, or Christendom, each one of them gets certain things right and a whole bunch of it wrong. And you have to pick and choose to find the puzzle piece of all the right answers. It's very taxing. It's meant to be taxing. Satan wants it to be taxing. He wants us at each other's throats, so we won't figure it out. He does not want a repeat of what happened in the 1800s when a whole lot of Jews and a whole lot of Christians of all kinds of denominations and, and conflicting you know, denominations within their own ranks, they all got together to organize Bible text. That kind of agreement is something Satan really doesn't want to happen again. He hated it so much in the 1800s that he brought out Joseph Smith, that he brought out Charles Darwin, and damn near anything else, spiritism, and everything else he could to deflect attention from the fact that for the first time in 1800 years, everybody was cooperating on the Bible. And it caused a revolutionary you know, upsurge in Bible study and Bible understanding. Because for once, the Jews and the Christians were cooperating with each other and learning from each other. And it's been about 200 years, and he's trying to break us apart. And we're pretty broken apart now. The Jews hate the Christians. The Christians hate the Jews. The Jews hate other Jews within the Judaism. Christians hate other Christians within Christendom. You know, it's a big mess now. And the Bible is the casualty of all that. The Bible's a big political football as to who owns it. Oh, well, because it's written in Greek. Well, we Greeks own it. No, you don't. You just happen to speak the same language. And you really don't speak the same language. Oh, well, we speak Hebrew, so the Bible is ours, and we have the right to say what it means. No, you don't. You just happen to speak the same language and really isn't the same language. Modern Hebrew and modern Greek are very different from ancient. Very different. So let's just set aside the ego and the turf wars and all that and get into what is this story? Okay, but that's what this story is about. Ego, turf wars, politics. And that's how Matthew opens it. To us, at least most Christians, Jews are, uh, have a big thing about this. To us, this is a very boring passage. So-and-so was a father of so-and-so was a father of so-and-so was a father of so-and-so. Okay? Until you dig into the meaning of these words, the names, it's an extremely boring story. Father of many nations was the father of laughter. Laughter was the father of Chisler. Beginning to get the idea that there's more to the story. And Chisler was the father of Prince of God, or Prince, really, and his brothers. Prince, ruler, scepter, was the father of struggle and seed. I forget what Tamar means. Struggle was the father of, and I forget what Hezron means. But see, if you know the meaning of the names, this is not so boring a story. Okay? Rahab the harlot married this guy, Solomon. Solomon. Shortened name for Solomon. Okay? So Rahab the harlot was a grandmother, was a grandmother, great grandmother. Boaz was the father of Obaid by Ruth. She was Moab. She was from Moab. And Obaid was the father of Jesse. So what? The great, great, great grandmother of David is a harlot. Tamar was also a harlot. She had these two kids out of wedlock by Judah. Now, if you're a Jew, you were really big on memorizing this stuff. That's what Isaiah 53, 8 is about. Who will recite his generations, his descendants? Because he isn't going to have any. 
Isaiah 53, 8. He has no descendants. He was cut off. The life, not cut off from the land of the living. I don't know what kind of incompetent translator translated it that way. The life was cut off from the land. Christ is the life. He has no descendants. Not physically. And that was a real big deal to the Jews. Why? Because Christ, that this whole record is why the Jews are big on genealogy. The genealogy from the sons of Abraham to the Jews, to David, to the Christ. They're tracking the time by means of the generations because they were on a schedule. That's why he's lumping them into 14s to show that the schedule got met. The three 14s of Isaiah 53, specifically 52, 13, 14. So what story do we have here? Turf war. Politics. What do you think religion is but politics? That's why I hate it so much. Religion and politics are two sides of a coin. The politicians have to make you feel religious about their causes so you'll vote for them. And the religions have to make you get political so you'll do something in their favor. Both are, both are invented by Satan. That's what Genesis 3 is all about. Satan invented religion in Genesis 3. Did God say you can't eat from every tree in the garden? No, God said one tree, but Satan reversed it. That's what politics is. Politics is the twisting of words. Okay, well, this is pretty twisted. Do you know how much politics is in here? A harlot? Oh, we can't have harlots in our family tree. God doesn't seem to care. All right. Another harlot here, and this is struggle. Oh, but laughter, Father Chisler. <gasps> we have a Chisler in our background, in our family tree. Yeah, that's political. You want to be well thought of? Okay, well, let's see. You were founded by a Chisler. You had a whole lot of struggle because this guy cheated this woman, his daughter-in-law, so she went and had sex with him. Ooh, that's incest. See, this isn't such a dull story, is it? And any Jew memorizing this would know that. 